our Lord is leading us to glory. Oh, so wonderful is He. He's our Savior. Wonderful is He. Praise Him ever. Wonderful is He. Christ our Savior. Leading us to realms of glory, singing as we go. Story, making known the love that made us free. That made us free forever. Wonderful salvation He is offering to all. Yes, our Lord is offering to all. Offering to all, wonderful is he who leads us lovingly above. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful is he. Thank you for joining us in our continued study through the book of James. My name is Chris Kramer with the Northside Church of Christ in Russellville, Kentucky. I'm here this evening with Brother Steve Mesker, who's one of our elders at Northside, and Brother Keith Baker another elder at Northside as well. Thank you, brethren, for joining me on this study tonight. We're continuing our thoughts from our last study from Wednesday evening, and if you had a chance to listen to that, then you're all caught up and ready to get into James chapter 3, and we'll be beginning with about verse mm, 7 and following around that area as we look at James giving us descriptions as to how the tongue is compared to a beast that we can tame or not. So let's look at some of the aspects of that as uh, we get into the study this evening. Uh, any thoughts you'd rather like to share before we get into our study? I don't think so. I'll, I'll have some comments later, but not okay. for now. Well, it's always great having you with us. And uh, so let's go ahead and start. When we look at the examples that James has already given, as I have pointed out in my past couple studies on this issue, I like James' approach. He uses these analogies to just kind of give examples of how we need to look at ourselves. And of course, the context of James chapter 3 centers heavily around uh, the use of the tongue, the very thing that can get us into trouble. Uh, but we also have to understand it's the very thing that can get us out of trouble. If we, with a wise mind and a wise heart from studying God's word, learn how to answer a matter. We need to think before we speak. I remember my father telling me that all my life. Uh, I don't know that it's sunk in yet, but at the same time, it's one of those principles that we have to remember what James said in James chapter uh, 1 and verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So what we're looking to produce is the righteousness of God. Uh, so let's begin in verse 7, where we left off the other day. And um, if Steve, you want to start us off with the reading there, and we'll just begin discussing that passage. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. You know, uh, when it talks about beast being tamed, I you know, kind of have a mental picture of a an elephant balancing on a ball. <laughs> you know, man can tame and do the most outstanding uh, jobs taming wild creatures. And we, we are just so amazed when we, we see, uh, you know, go to a circus and see these kind of things. Uh, but yet, it is makes it so difficult that same man cannot tame and control his own tongue without the help of God and without working hard and reminding them uh, on a on a daily basis to that this tongue can the the damages that this tongue can do. You know, I think is it the next verse. Uh, yeah, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Um, it's true. I mean, the Bible says no man can tame this tongue completely, but it can be brought under control with God's help. Not to say that we won't slip and, and say something that we shouldn't. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to describe what he means when he says no man can tame the tongue. 
and he uses the example of the beast. And, and this is kind of how I look at it as well. And I appreciate what you said a minute ago, Steve, about not without the help of God. That is certainly at the heart of the context of what we're talking about. Because if we try to do anything on our own, uh, we just ultimately can't be fully successful. We may try and, and be successful for a time period, but in the long run of things, we need to look at God's plan, His wisdom, His word within our hearts. And so all animals, for the most part, can be trained. Um, and, and when you talk, we use that example of the elephant on the ball and all, um, you know, he, he, knows his, he knows his job. He's been trained to do a particular stunt. Uh, we train our pets, our dogs, yeah. Even a cat can be trained, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and most animals can be trained in a certain way. And usually it's done through, um, you know, the use of rewards or food or whatever it may be. Uh, God certainly offers us a reward at the end. I don't mean to liken us to animals or whatnot, but James does in the sense that we have something in our mind, in our hearts that control everything that we do. So God's word is like that. I really hate to use the term whip or, or something like that, but it's, it's the, it's the thing, the tool that God uses to rein us in. Uh, the other day when we talked about putting bits in horses' mouths, if you caught that program, I, I was really stumbling for my words. I was using the example of a bit in the mouth with the pencil, and I was talking about the leash or the rope, and, and the reins was the term that I was trying to think of at the moment, uh, because you rein in an animal. Now, we are constantly having to keep the tongue under control. You cannot let it off its leash. Eventually, you can let a dog off its leash if you train him right. And he'll go out and he'll fetch or he'll take care of his business and come back to you. If you let the tongue off the leash, well, it's out there. And it will cause harm and damage and devastation as it goes on. So I, one way I look at this passage is that it, it, it's not tame to the point that it can stand on its own. It always has to be under control. The, uh, the way that I look at uh, verse 8 when it says, but no man can tame the tongue, I'm kind of thinking, uh, but no man, if I could put parentheses there, by himself can tame his tongue. It, it requires uh, God's intervention. <clears throat> I, keep, I keep thinking about... Uh what the Bible says about uh, out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If, uh, if someone is not uh, convinced that they, they want to serve God and uh, follow him, then you know, this is something they're not gonna really, really worry about. It, it's taming the tongue. So the first thing we gotta do is get our hearts right and uh, our minds right. Um, before we even have um, a chance to tame the tongue, or, as or, we're going or to, the, do, uh, as or, we're going or the to, desire, as we're going to kind of mention here, it is a reflection. What we say is kind of a reflection of how we are and what we are inside. I'm sorry to interrupt, Keith. I, I thought we were finished. It's fine. I'm done now. I'm uh, trying to tame my tongue. <laughs> Well, you know, we we're, uh, I'm reminded of a few passages that we were looking at Wednesday and we kind of, you know, had to hurriedly talk about them because we were running out of time. But, you know, uh, the Bible teaches us that we must impart grace to the hearer. And so how do we do that? We do it through the things that we say. Um, granted, we don't walk around all day long with a Bible in our hands, quoting scripture every moment of the day. Um, but we can use scripture in every aspect of our lives. As we look at how we work, how we play, uh, how we raise our families, it's not just about what we do when we, quote unquote, go to church. It's a matter of how we live. And so imparting grace is a, um, I think one of you may have mentioned the other night uh, about building habits in our lives. And really, in taming the tongue, to use that term, it, it has to be an ab habitual thing. We have to train it. We have to get used to things. I think we'd all admit as we 
get older and, and strive for more godliness in life, whether it's a matter of, oh, saying curse words, uh, which many young children mm-hmm. struggle with because society as a whole accepts curse words. And children are caught in, into the, you know, the tug of war between doing what is morally right versus what the world readily accepts. Many horrible words are used in our society today that I've been told by people of the world, hey, that's just the way we talk. And I don't accept that as an answer because, um, you know, as I get older, I, I don't have a desire to say a curse word. Um, you know, if I hit my thumb with a hammer, which I've been known to do from time to time, it, it's easy for me to yell out an owl or ah, you know, things that are not even words. I express myself. I, I, I get up out of bed and I, I make what they call, you know, old man sounds, you know, it's like, ah, oh. <laughs> I can't bend down and pick up something off the floor without going, Ugh, you know, but I don't need to curse or say a negative word uh, that, um, you know, that is based on profanity, uh, using language in a, um, in a gross sense. Oftentimes we think of curse and we also think about the things that we say toward other people. And people use curse words as a matter of, well, just that, cursing. You know, they'll put their fist up in the air. And I think a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned how people react when they're driving in the car. It's hard for them to do things when they're just sitting there. But, well, they'll put that fist in the air and they'll yell obscenities out of their mouth towards somebody that's cut them off in traffic or something like that. Uh, so you see that people react in a temperamental way through the words that they use. And it usually shows the reflection of, of how they feel inside. And a root cause of that sometimes is, is anger or a lack of temperament. So there are a lot of ways we could take that discussion. Just a couple of uh, quick verses here. Uh, Psalms thirty four thirteen. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile or, or deceit. Uh, Titus 2, verse 8. Paul speaking to the young men, you know, you, you mentioned how the language of, of so many young people today, Paul speaking to the young men in, in 2 verse 6, uh, that they should have sound speech, that they cannot be condemned. I mean, and that's so true of us today, sound speech. I'd I like to say too, I'd like to say too that in this, this day and time with so much uh so much going on that um, we've never seen before it's very easy for us to get get caught up in the um negativity of all all that's going on and uh, but i want to i'm trying trying really hard and just to be to be positive about so many uh, things that that we still have that are um, very good um, about this country and about our our lives and um, and I think all of us need to to focus on trying to keep with the positive. Uh, I know I know most of us are on Facebook and there's so much negativity and and I just think we need to be extremely careful of the things we comment on and uh, and that's just like that goes along with uh, our tongue, what we what we type, and uh, it, it, it just it's just something I think that we all should should think about and, and be focused on, especially right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent point because as we look at how we communicate with one another through whether it's words on paper, words in text form, words on the computer, that's all a part of communication. What he's talking about in general is, is communication because what the tongue does comes from up here, comes from the heart, comes from the mind. It, it, you can tell a person's you know, feelings about things when they air them. But remember what the Bible says, and we read this from Proverbs, I think it was 29 the other night, that uh, you know, a fool vents his feelings. A fool says everything that is on his mind and then uses the excuse, hey, I was only joking, or hey, I'm just mm-hmm. telling it like it is kind of thing. We, we have a lot of that in the world too much to the, to the hurt of other people. And people don't think about what they say and how they hurt other people and how, most importantly, 
uh, you know, they bring devastation to people's spiritual lives. Um, I remember one time, one of our, you know, bless her heart, as we like to say, you know, a, a sister in Christ uh, kind of got on to me a little bit because I made a statement from the pulpit once that I didn't like carrots. <laughs> and, uh, and I like some kind of carrots, don't get me wrong. But uh, she, she was so worried that, you know, some of the children might be listening to that and, and that what I said would influence them. And as innocent as it may have seemed, I believe that she has a valid point. And I've been very careful since then not to make comments like that unless it's about lima beans or something yucky like that. But no, my, my point is, is that um, I wasn't thinking about the power of words. Uh, in a moment like that, I may be thinking more about my own pride that somehow my words may seem to have some kind of power. But, you know, in the world at large, you know, stocks raise and fall by the words that a politician will say or a corporate leader. Uh, because we do value the thoughts and the opinions of others, whether they're always good thoughts or good opinions, uh, we still take in the words that people say. So I'm careful not to say things like that any longer. I believe one of you had a comment. I saw a hand go up. Yeah. And I, didn't. I was just going to say we we really need to to focus our time and our our words, um, I guess, on on uh, sharing the gospel to people and not and not worry about all this negativity if uh if all of us i think think we spend as much time um sharing and and um being the right examples would be, be much better off well let me let me follow that up with the verse that i should have quoted earlier from ephesians chapter four and i mentioned a little bit about what it said uh, but in ephesians four and verse 29 the, the full text says this, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. So, so we need to ask ourselves, uh, not just what we're saying, but what we're putting into our minds and hearts is what's going to come out of our mouths. And, and yes, looking at sources like social media, things like that, I use it, all, all three of us do. Uh, we see a lot of the benefits and the goodness in a lot of the things that, that we can impart, but, but it's a tough challenge. Sometimes you, you want to, sometimes you want to respond to what somebody says with a smart alecky remark or, or make your position shown. But at the same time, I don't want to get caught in the middle of casting my pearls before swine. I don't want to get caught in the middle of a back and forth barrage. Uh, just because I'm preaching the truth doesn't always mean that that is the place to make my argument. And uh, remember James here, he's not making his argument to the world. He's writing to Christians who are scattered throughout the world and teaching them how to deal with the world. And so though our voices may not be heard, you know, in the world at large, you know, my, my stand of the gospel is never going to be picked up by mainstream media. I'm never going to be on CNN or Fox news or anything like that. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can't impart goodness, grace, and, and, and the good word of God, you know, in our circle of life in in those that we contact day by day, when's the last time that we spoke the gospel just to the neighbor living next to us, to the person that we accidentally bumped into in the store. Uh, there are opportunities every single day. And though our voices may have the capability to be heard across the world, Sometimes we're not talking to the people that are right in front of us. And so, um, you know, we've got, we got to be careful about that. You back know, in James, the, yeah, go ahead, Steve. Uh, the verse that you quoted really goes along with verses 9 and 10 that we're fixing to come, come up to. Uh, and I would urge, you know, and we're talking about sharing for people. I would urge people to... Uh, try to memorize verse 10 because that is a useful verse that it, it comes up in our everyday conversation with uh, coworkers and all. Uh, and it's talking about the hip hypocrisy, uh, you know, out of the same mouth, blessing and cursing. We don't, we hear that a lot from the same person. And so this would be a good verse to commit to memory. 
I have met atheists several times in my life, but I have to honestly say where I live, the people I associate with on a regular basis, I don't know anyone that says they don't believe in God. Uh, that isn't part of my circle of, of friends, life, things like that. That being said, out of all those that claim to love the Lord, I can, I can tell you there are many that use bad language. There are many that speak ill of others. There are many that just don't live the Christian life that they should be living. And of course, the Lord has a word for that, and that's called hypocrisy. And, you know, we've all been guilty of it at some point or another in our lives. We've all said things we wish we hadn't. And th that's the point. Can, do we strive to take them back? Do we strive to fix things, make them right? You know, let, let's just read verse 10, uh, verse 9 and 10. And it says, with it, we bless our God and Father. And with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the mouth, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing my brethren these things ought not to be so i can kind of see james putting his fist down yeah. these things must not be so i mean it's a very uh, direct uh command here uh from james these things ought not be so blessing and cursing you know, Jesus gave an example of a, of a prayer, two prayers, actually. One of a Pharisee, you know, a religious person that looked at himself and bragged on himself a little bit. He said, Lord, look at all that I'm doing for you. And then he looked at a tax collector, a heathen, a man that cheated people. And he said, I thank God that I'm not like that guy over there. Hmm. And of course, that guy over there, that tax collector and that cheat, he was humbling himself before God in his prayer. And he says... You know, he didn't make an argument for himself. He didn't list his good qualities. He didn't say, well, I'm a good person. He said, um, be merciful to me, a sinner. He beat his chest. Uh, you can see the agony in his own life, in his own heart toward himself. And, of course, it says of that that he went to his house justified rather than the religious Pharisee individual that was bragging on himself. And I kind of look at that with this passage because... You know, we've got this attitude in the world that we're doing God's will and that we love God. But then we turn right around and say, but I don't care for people too much. I'm just not a people person. <laughs> well, that goes exactly against what the Bible says. When the Bible says that loving the Lord is loving our brethren, <clears throat> loving one another. And how we treat one another is how we treat God. Did not Jesus say, if you clothe them and feed them and give them drink when they're thirsty, that you're doing the same to me. And so he says, if you don't do these things, you're not doing them to me. So uh, James, uh, excuse me, John talks about that in his letters, comparing the love of God to the love of brethren. He says, how can we say that we love God and yet hate our brother? He calls a man like that a liar. So that's how God makes that distinction. You can't just say it's between you and God. The Bible never teaches us that. We're responsible for our own actions, but we cannot curse one another and then turn right around and show up at church on a Sunday morning and start giving praise and blessing to God. He will not accept that. He uses a um, human analogy here that I think we can all understand well uh, in verses 11 and 12 when he says, Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Uh, can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. So the truth of the matter is, if you have pure water and you add something to it, it becomes impure. And the tongue is the same way. We can't just say, well, we speak bad some of the time, you know. Um, you know, the old saying that we used to tell our children, especially when we went to church services, be on your best behavior. Well, that's something we need to live by. That's the way we need to be every single day, not just when we go to church, as we say, or go to a neighbor's house. Uh, being on our best behavior should be in every element of our lives. Can we be spoiled rascals throughout the week and then say Sunday, we're going to do it, you know, good and kind. That's going to be our one day of godliness. And is God going to accept that? And is that going to be enough to get us into heaven? Not according to these passages. And so if you add a little bit of uh, 
well, let's just say poison, you know, to a gallon of water, you're not going to drink that water. Even though most of it's pure, that little bit of poison is going to keep you from, from, uh, well, hurting yourself. Keith? Uh, I remember as a, a kid, my um, neighbors over here had, had, had sulfur water. And there wasn't any, any time that that water wasn't, wasn't sulfur. I mean, it didn't, it didn't come out a sulfur sometimes and every, every once in a while you'd get a um, drink of good water. It was always, it was always sulfur water. So that kind of <laughs> explains this verse here a little bit. You know, it's what I think about when I read this verse. Uh, it says, does a spring send forth uh, uh, fresh water and bitter water from the same opening? Well, yeah, there was one time. <laughs> Remember <laughs> when uh, Moses, he was directed by God to throw a log or a stick or a piece of wood into the bitter water and it became sweet. So I would have to say, uh, not unless God intervenes and performs a miracle. Exactly. And you made that point earlier, or, or, excuse me, earlier in the lesson that, you know, man can't do this on his own. He's got to have God's, God's help. You know, bad water can be purified and that's what God's looking to do for us. Uh, Keith, I remember years ago when we went on a hiking trip, you took this little contraption with you and we could take water out of the spring and you could run it through this thing and it would purify the water mm -hmm. uh, so that we could have fresh water to drink. And so you can take something that's, that's bad and, and make it into something good. And that should be a goal of every single one of us. I've met too many people in life that give up on themselves and say, well, I'm just too bad. Well, that might be the case. But what God has offered us is an opportunity for forgiveness and making changes in our lives. Don't let your dirty mouth destroy your soul. You can change that. You can change those habits. And you may slip up from time to time along the way. But here's the difference between somebody that's, uh, you know, got it. Uh, what's the word I'm trying to use? You know, got it worked out or he's got that problem licked, you might say. Not to use a tongue pun, but... Um, <laughs> You know, and licking a problem, it's a matter of um, working on it. It's a matter of trying. You know, I have a friend now outside the body of Christ who, you know, he always talks about how he, he tries to watch his language a little bit better around me. He doesn't always do a good job, but he does admit the fact that I know I need to make some changes. And that's the first step people need to take in their lives. Do not ever resolve yourself to being that guy that can't tame the talk. Resolve yourself to being the guy that will let God help you. Let God tame your tongue. Uh, let God help you develop better habits in your life that you may make those necessary changes. And in order to do that, I think let's go ahead and wrap up chapter three, because even though he changes the context of it a little bit, the principle of what we need to apply to our life is still there. And what we're talking about here in a broader sense is the wisdom of God. And that's why, again, you can go back to the book of Proverbs and you can find so many great teachings on how to apply godly wisdom to your life. And what Proverbs does is it helps you develop the habits that you need to develop godly wisdom. Although Proverbs doesn't teach you about you know, salvation or baptism or, or being a member of the church, it tells you how to have those qualities so that when you read the New Testament, you see the instructions that are given, then you have a, a better mind, a better head uh, on your shoulders to perceive the wisdom of God in these things. Uh, Brethren, one of you want to read verses 13 and following, then we'll kind of wrap up our discussion with an overview of that. I'll read that. Okay. Who is wise? and understanding among you. Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you, having bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion, 
and every evil thing will be there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peace, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. All right. Um, that, that's a beautiful chapter. And of course it makes the distinction between earthly wisdom and godly wisdom. Um, you know, he says that there is wisdom of the world, but it's not the kind of wisdom that's going to save your soul, is it? Uh, we can talk like the smartest people on, in, on the planet. We can get our higher education from um, ungodly men, and we can learn a lot about uh, who we are as a people. But who are we as a spiritual people? That's where God wants us to put our efforts and help us to focus upon the fact that the wise and understanding is shown by good conduct. Now, we've given in a whole series on faith and works back over in chapter 2, but this is just another verse to yet prove the point that the things that we say and the things that we do are shown in our conduct. It'll show our faith. And you can tell a man of faith by the things that he says and does. And so when we look at the meekness of wisdom, it is in direct opposition to the things that the tongue gets us in trouble with. And those characteristics are right there in verse 14. If you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Those are things that are done with the tongue. Those are the expressions that man makes. And so we need to be careful what we say. We need to say kind things, good things, not things that are full of envy and self-seeking. Um, but I, I like verse 16. This kind of reminds me of what Keith said a little while ago in regard to the way that we treat social media sometimes. Confusion and every evil thing are there. I got to admit, every time I watch one news report versus another news report, I'm confused. Is it or isn't it? Who is it? What is it? Uh, there was an actor that passed away yesterday. And um, one news report said he was 42. Another news report said he was 43. I know that's a simple thing, but that just proves my point. Who do you believe? You got to do a little bit more deeper investigation. It doesn't matter to me how old he was. It's just that's the way we treat even the bigger things in life. And so verse 17 and 18 is the beautiful part that shows us how we can use our tongues and our daily conduct, that the wisdom that is above is pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. That's the kind of people we need to be and the kind of things that we need to say so that we can produce the fruit of righteousness. And that's a wonderful lesson in and of itself because there, uh, I like in, in some of Paul's letters, he, he puts little lists together, you know, of the way of the ways that, you know, the fruit of the spirit is shown in our lives. And much of it's about the character uh, of man, our conduct, Paul, the apostle, excuse me, Peter, the apostle in second Peter lists the things that we should add to our faith. And many of them are about our character and what we have to build upon in our daily habits in life. So there's a lot of directions, a lot of continued uh, study we could take toward this subject. Uh, but any last thoughts you'd like to share with us, brethren, before we um, wrap up our discussion? Just a reminder, our words are an, a verbal response. Or, uh, it, it, it shows what's actually in, in us. So be, be aware of what we speak. And as far as the last few verses that we talked about, uh, make a distinction between wisdom from God and wisdom from man. And just a reminder in the first few verses of, of James, you know, it says that we should ask God for wisdom. And uh, it's free for the asking. And uh, then lastly, uh, Proverbs fourteen twelve is while we're speaking about the wisdom of man versus God. There's a way that seems right. It seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That's all. One, 
I'm sorry, I thought you were done, Steve. I am. Okay. One, one final reminder, learn the value of, of silence. Um, learn, learn when to keep our mouth shut. And also watch our tone and always think before we speak. And that's all of God. And if we don't remember those principles, how, how can we, uh, you know, apply them to our lives? Uh, and it's all about developing those good habits. And so um, I'm going to leave you with one last passage too. And this one's from the book of Psalm, uh, Psalm chapter 19. I believe it's very poetic in nature. But when we talk about that spring that sends forth, you know, either the sweet water or the, the bitter water, uh, I'm reminded of, you know, just that sweet, you know, taste of, of honey. Um, and, of course, there's a very poetic uh, verse that I can read here. Um, excuse me, my pages are stick, sticking together in my Bible a little bit. Uh, Psalm chapter 19 and verse 7 and following. And we will leave everyone with this verse here. Uh, before I read it, I want to thank you all for joining us in our study tonight. We'd like you to ask us questions or even a follow-up comment or two. You can email us at Northside Church of Christ at hotmail.com. You can search the internet for our, um, our list of Bible studies that we have online. And of course, our worship service that we have uh, for, for the time being every Sunday morning beginning at 10. As many of you know, we're now uh, partially meeting in the building and a limited capacity, but also in the parking lot for those that don't feel comfortable coming inside. Uh, bring your masks. If you forget them, we have some at the door for you. Just um, remember that for every Sunday morning. So let's end with this thought here. And please take this with you through the week. And uh, it says, Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. So we have something beautiful, tasty, and uh, we want to hunger and thirst for righteousness. We hope you'll apply these thoughts to your lives. If we can help you in any way, please let us know. We thank you for joining us tonight. Have a wonderful week ahead. Wonderful is Jesus who saves the soul. Wonderful is he who can keep us whole. That is why we seek the eternal goal in the wondrous glory land. Our Lord is leading us to glory. Oh, so wonderful is He. He's our Savior. Wonderful is He. Praise Him ever. Wonderful is He. Christ our Savior. Leading us to realms of glory, singing as we go. Making known the love that made us free, that made us free forever. Wonderful salvation he is offering to all. Yes, our Lord is offering to all. Offering to all. Wonderful is he who leads us lovingly above. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful is he.